Members of the jury, the defendant is charged with the crime of grand larceny in the second degree. Larceny means stealing. One who takes the personal property of another with intent to deprive the owner of, a perma of it permanently steals that property and is guilty of larceny. And if the property be taken from the person of the owner, it is grand larceny. If taken in the daytime, it is grand larceny in the second degree without regard to the amount taken. Ordinarily, stealing property of the value of $100 or less is petty larceny. But if five cents be taken from the pocket of another person in the daytime, it is grand larceny in the second degree. The indictment in the case charges that the defendant took $32 from the person of the complainant in the daytime. The defendant denies it. He pleads not guilty. That raises an issue of fact. There is no question of law here. There is a simple question of fact. Did the defendant take any money from the person of the complainant? If he did, he is a thief. There is no doubt about that. The defense is that he did not take anything from the person of the complaining witness and that he was not concerned with anyone else in the taking. The indictment is intended to let the defendant know the charge that has been made against him and it is also the means adopted to have that question settled. It is the only way to bring a man into court. There are two parties to the action. This is a criminal case. On the one hand, you have the people. They do not want anybody to take the property or injure the person of another. They pass laws to prevent it, and if the charge is made that, somewhat, that someone has violated one of those laws, they have him indicted and brought in here to have that question settled. The indictment, therefore, is only a complaint. It is no proof of guilt. It is not evidence of guilt, and notwithstanding the finding of the defendant of the indictment, the defendant is presumed to be innocent. That is, the presumption is that he did nothing, and the burden is on the people of proving him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There is no, there's only one way of proving anything, and that is by the production of witnesses. Witnesses are called by one side and examined and subjected to cross-examination by the other side. It is the duty of the court to see that they answer every proper question. Of course, the court has no knowledge of the facts in these cases. As you have heard me say repeatedly, the court is here pursuant to law. The people have their own lawyer, the district attorney, and the burden is upon him of moving these cases for trial. The law says he must be diligent and active and faithful to the people, and he proves that by moving these cases for trial. It is alleged that this crime was committed on the 28th of July, that is four months ago, so there has been no undue haste in the trial. When the district attorney puts it on the calendar, he makes a demand on the court to try it, and it is my duty not to shirk my duty, but to see that demand is granted. It is the duty of the court to see that no unnecessary hardship is put on the complainant who comes to this court. They must be given as speedy a hearing as possible, consistent with justice, so that when the defendant's case appeared on the calendar today, it was the duty of the court to insist upon his going to trial, notwithstanding the unsworn statement that his attorney had been sick for 10 days. If he were sick 10 days, he had plenty of time to get another lawyer, and the court assigned to the defendant two lawyers, who are doubtless as able in every respect as the gentleman who was retained by him. No injustice was done to him at all. He has had a full, complete, and fair hearing. That is all the court did. It is the duty of each juror to be faithful to his trust. If you have a lawsuit, you would have a lawyer, and it would be his duty to be vigilant and faithful and alert in the protection of your rights, that is, in the civil courts. In the criminal courts, there are two parties just the same. The people select their own lawyer once in four years. They elect a district attorney on his promise to be vigilant, honest, faithful, and zealous. And the district attorney has done his duty. The attorneys for the defense have the same rights. They have to resist 
every effort of the people to convict their client. They call witnesses and they cross-examine the people's witnesses and it is their duty to try and persuade you that the people have either failed to make out a case or that the defendant has proved that he was not guilty.